Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Steinberg Hellion 7 tutorial series. Today we're going to begin our investigation of the various zone types. We're going to start off today with the synth zone and in particular we're going to examine the oscillator section of the synth zone. The oscillator page is the one, uh, is the, the, the section that is most different for the various different zone types. This is the one that really contains the DNA of the sound. We're going to figure out how synth zones work today. If you're enjoying this series and you'd like to help support my channel, check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below. It's an awesome way to do that. What we have here is an init analog synth preset, the simplest building block of an analog sound. And you can see that we've got three oscillators engaged. I'm actually going to turn two of them off. For the most part today, we only need to deal with a single oscillator because we're going to have a look at the various options in the oscillator section. There's one other piece of housekeeping I want to do before we get underway as well. I want to remove velocity sensitivity from my keyboard. At the moment, if I press a very quiet key and a loud key, you can see that it's generating different sizes of sine waves. I want to take that away. This is going to require me to dip into the envelope section and head down to this um, option called level velocity. It's currently set to 100, which gives us velocity sensitivity. And if you set that to zero, you're going to remove velocity sensitivity. It's going to make my examples that I give you today much easier to demonstrate if they're all operating at the same volume. So here we have a sine wave, the basic building block of sound in the universe. Everything that you've ever heard is just a combination of sine waves and it's a sound that everybody's familiar with. If you look at it in the spectrum analyze, you've got this single fundamental harmonic at 130 0.8 hertz and as you can see in the virtual keyboard below that's outputting a C2. Now that's not very useful from the perspective of subtractive synthesis. This is a subtractive synthesis zone and sine waves aren't very good for that because there's nothing to take away. The principle of subtractive synthesis is that you have a complex wave that has many harmonics and you sculpt those harmonics to generate a more interesting sound. And you can't do that with a sine wave. But as a building block, it's fantastic. And so it's the first entry in our table. Let's have a look at one of the others. We'll go down to triangle. And a quick overview of triangles, saws and squares. The reason why so many um, synthesizers have sine, triangle, um, saw and pulse slash square, we'll talk about that in a, in a moment, is that they're the four mathematical algorithms that are easiest to implement inside an analog synthesizer. They're like the primary colours of sound, really. They all boil down to a very simple mathematical formula that can then be turned into control voltages in an analog synthesizer and ultimately generate sound. So pretty much every subtractive synthesizer you've ever heard uses those four basic building blocks um, or any combination thereof to make its sounds. So it's no accident that they're the top four in the list. Let's have a quick run through them. Triangle first. See in the oscilloscope, it's generating a triangle shape. And we have this now many more waves than the original single harmonic that the sine wave was generating. A triangle generates odd harmonics. So if our basic frequency is 130, the third harmonic is at 390 plus a little bit hertz. So a harmonic is simply a linear multiple. If, you, if you're dealing with the fifth harmonic, it's 130 times five and a triangle wave contains all of the odd harmonics of the fundamental. And the nature of the triangle algorithm specifies the slope, this, this descending slope. The, the waves get quieter and quieter the further away they get from the fundamental. That's also true of a square wave. I'm gonna jump over to the fourth entry to have a quick look at square waves. Now, can you see that it's called square PWM? PWM stands for pulse width modulation. The reason why I said square waves were slightly unusual is because strictly speaking, they're actually pulse waves and a pulse wave with a 50% duty cycle is called a square wave. In order for me to get a square wave out of this thing, if I press a key now, you're not going to hear a square. You're going to hear a pulse. I need to set this waveform value to 50. I'll press the key again and then explain what I've just done. Here's a square wave. And the comparison that I wanted to draw between square waves and triangle waves is that they both have the same harmonics. It's the rate of descent that's different with a square wave. You have a shallower rate of descent than a triangle. It's a fundamentally louder sound than a triangle. 
but nevertheless all these harmonics are 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11 and so on and so on. The reason I had to set this waveform knob to 50 is because that's the duty cycle of a pulse wave. So with this wave type called square PWM, I really wish they just called it pulse because that's really what it is. And when you're dealing with a pulse wave, you get access to this waveform knob that allows you to set the width of the pulse. So I'm gonna press this key now. Currently it's a square wave. And if I change the waveform shape, now you can see the width of the pulse changing. So the pulse width of a pulse wave is the relative widths of the on and off nature of the wave. You can see the high, high bit and the low bit, and they change width as we change the waveform shape. So now that we've been introduced to this waveform knob, let's go back and have a look at the triangle. Waveform knob disappears. So it's context sensitive control, sine wave doesn't have a waveform knob either, that's only relevant for particular wave types. Sines, triangles and saws don't have a waveform knob, all of the others do. Let's have a look at the fourth of the simple building blocks, the sawtooth wave. And this is the subtractive synthesis's best friend because the sawtooth has all harmonics of the fundamental. Triangles and squares only have odd harmonics, but the sawtooth is unique among the basic wave types because it's the only one that has even harmonics as well. In fact, it has all of the harmonics. So now when, it, when I press a, a note, you get lots more harmonics. And if I just hover over the second harmonic, it's at 260 Hertz. So every single peak in this wave is an extra 130 being added on, 390, 520, so on and so on. So those are our primary colors of sound. And now over the rest of the episode, we're gonna uh, explore some of the interesting things that we can do to manipulate them. The first thing that I'm gonna do is head back to the, I'm gonna call it pulse wave, cause that's really what it is. And I want to play with this waveform control. Pulse width modulation is a really common thing in analog synthesis which is a process whereby while the note's sounding, this wave shape changes dynamically over time. Now, I don't want to sit there basically playing a note and then twiddling this knob. I want the synthesizer to do it for me. I want Hallian to do it for me. So let's take a moment to plug in a little bit of modulation onto this control. So a couple of things that I want you to kind of pay attention to as we've clicked on this control. The first thing is that down below, in the uh, oscillator modulation row, it says OSC1 waveform. So any control that I click in the primary interface can be highlighted in this modulation section. If it's capable of being modulated, you'll see a little arrow above it. So just by looking at this oscillator section, we can see there are three white arrows. Each one of those three controls can be modulated from this modulation row. I'm just going to click around a couple of the controls in the section to show you as I click on each individual one, the modulation row changes. This is a shortcut, don't forget. This is basically just a single view of one modulatable parameter. So now I'm going to map a modulation source into this waveform control knob. I'm going to click plus in the add modulation section. And even though we've not explicitly dealt with LFOs yet, I'm going to assign a low frequency oscillator to it. I did this in a previous episode and it should be relatively intuitive. I'm going to give myself a little bit of modulation depth. And now when I press a key, watch this little, or, uh, this arrow, it's changed orange. That tells you that there's now a modulation source mapped to this control. Watch what happens to it when I press a key. So that control on the outside of the knob is dynamically updating to reflect the nature of the modulation in the background. So we've got this sine wave oscillating in the background at one hertz, one cycle per second, and it's applying an amount of modulation determined by my modulation depth here to this control. If I manually change the position of the waveform knob, that's now the center point around which that modulation will occur. We just implemented pulse width modulation on the synthesizer. Really simple stuff. Let's get rid of it, delete the modulation, and the arrow turns back white. 
I'm going to stick with our basic waveform shapes. I will explain the other options a little bit later, but I'm just going to bring us back to a sine wave to keep things really simple so that I can explain the other um, options in the section. Next, we have this retrigger mode. Now, at the moment, you can only hear a single wave. And so this retrigger mode has nothing to do because it's all about phase. At the moment, this oscillator is in free phase, which means in the background, without me touching a key or doing anything at all, the oscillator is spinning all the time, it's doing its thing. When I press a key, I'm effectively opening a gate that allows you to hear that wave, whatever it happens to be doing at the time. And when I let the key go, the sound stops again. The term phase describes where in the waveform shape, we begin the drawing of that wave. And it's utterly pointless, meaningless, if you're only ever listening to a single wave. The only point at which phase becomes interesting is when we introduce a second wave and we play those uh, waves relative to each other. So I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna bring in a second oscillator. For the purpose of this demonstration, it doesn't matter what the oscillator levels are, but it does matter that they're identical. They're both at 33 and that's fine. What I'm gonna do now is bring up a loudness meter on Insight below. This short term value is the one that you're interested in. That's telling you how loud the note is. Don't forget we've disabled velocity sensitivity. So all of these notes should be identical volume. The next thing that I'm going to do is explicitly set the phase of these two waves to fixed phase. And I'm going to leave them at zero degrees. I'll explain why, what that means in a moment. Basically what these, uh, what's happened now is that these two sine waves have been explicitly locked together. Every time I press a key on the keyboard, they're going to start playing at exactly the same time. And I want you to take a note of what the volume is going to be. It takes a few seconds to bottom out because it's an average sound over the last three seconds. And there we've got minus 14. Minus 14 decibels is the volume of these two sine waves combined together. If I turn one of these oscillators off, the volume is going to drop by six decibels because it's going to be basically half as loud as it was. So the reading will now be minus 20. Okay, simple science. That's constructive interference. If you play two identical waves, they sum their values together and the sound gets twice as loud. Now I'm gonna send oscillator two out of phase. I'm gonna double click its value and type 180. Now I'm gonna press a key on the keyboard. I did press a key on the keyboard and you're hearing absolute silence. Those two waves are cancelling each other out. They're out of phase. A sine wave is perfectly symmetrical. If you have a look at the shape, what I've basically done is I've made oscillator two start drawing at this point where my mouse currently is. And as it's going down, oscillator one's going up. Those two waveforms are perfectly cancelling each other out and the result is silence. Phase is critically important in sound engineering. You need to understand it. Every sound engineer in the world has a really good understanding of phase because it's critically important in a genuine practical sense. Things like phase cancellation from uh, microphones around a drum kit, they're really important. This stuff matters. And this retrigger control allows us to specify that phase control, allows us to basically offset these waves against each other for specific effect. I'll just start playing some keys on the keyboard now, just press C and I'll bring this phase down a little bit. And as I pull down from 180 degrees, you can see the waves getting louder and louder in the oscilloscope until eventually I get all the way back down to zero. And once again, they're twice as loud as the individual wave. But phase cancellation isn't just one of those mathematical curiosities. It really has a genuine tonal impact as well. Let's play with something that has a little bit more harmonic content. So we'll switch to sawtooths. Sawtooths are always much louder than sine, so I'll just check my, my levels. Okay, we're good to go. Now here's the sound of two sawtooths in perfect phase. Now I'll start knocking them out of phase. It's a little bit similar to what we were doing with the pulse width modulation on the pulse wave. It's not exactly the same effect, but it's, it's causing a tonal change as we travel through the phase. And you can see why in the oscilloscope, each one of these different settings, where I'm setting these two waves against each other and they're basically playing out of sync. 
and therefore you get you're getting new and interesting patterns of constructive and destructive interference between those two waves. It's resulting in interesting stuff happening in the oscilloscope. That's all we're interested in. Doing interesting stuff with these waves. Subtractive synthesis is all about manipulating these basic wave shapes for interesting effect. Have a look at it in the spectrum analyzer. I've set my phase quite low here. And you get these really interesting bumps. This is called a comb filter. When you take two identical waves and you offset them in time and play them together, you end up with this result called comb filtering. And it's called that because it looks like the teeth of a comb in a spectrum analyzer. Individual specific frequencies have been sculpted out of the, out of the wave. Because don't forget there is an exact mathematical relationship between these two waves. They are identical. It's only their offsets that's different. And so that results in this regular pattern of individual harmonics of the, of the, seri of the harmonic series being cancelled out. So this isn't just dry, boring maths. This is real stuff that you really want to know. This is how you make interesting sounds with a, with a subtractive synthesizer. If you wanted to accomplish that effect, you know when I was playing all of those notes with the sawtooth wave and changing the phase each time and getting different tonal effects? Well, wouldn't it be really nice if we had an option to randomly change the phase every time we pressed a key? Wouldn't it be called something like a random phase? So now it's simply setting one option in the phase control in the retrigger section, we've generated that, that new interesting tone. Now, every single time I press a key, I'm gonna get a different relationship between those two waves. I'm gonna get a different tonal effect. Now, using random phase is a bit radical because you've got no control over the, over the wave shape at all. You've got basically 360 variants to play with, but it's a very cool option to have. So that's what's done for phase. I can turn oscillator two back off again for a moment. Next, we have our tuning controls. Octave tuning, pretty obvious what that's gonna do. Play a single note on my keyboard and up one octave, and back down again. Course control allows me to go up in semitones. And fine tuning allows me to adjust the pitch in one hundredths of a semitone, they're called scents. If I play a C and then increase it by 100 cents. I'm playing exactly a C sharp. Let's have a little play with modulating the pitch dynamically. Do exactly the same as I did earlier, but at the moment, because I've got the tuning section selected, oscillator one pitch is highlighted in my um, shortcut row, my oscillator modulation row. So now if I add an LFO to pitch, guess what's gonna happen? And there's the orange indicator telling me what the current pitch is. If I set the course tuning up a little bit, now this orange indicator has been offset to tell you where the center point is. And there's the modulation. Turn the modulation back off. Reset my tuning to zero. Underneath the tuning controls, we have this very seemingly innocent button called multi. But when you turn multi oscillator on, all hell breaks loose because each oscillator is capable of generating up to eight different versions of itself simultaneously. At the moment, the number of multi voices is set to one. As I start increasing it, you'll see there are decimal fractions. It means there is a third oscillator in play at the moment. It's just 80% of the volume of the other two. Now, when I press this note, you're basically just gonna hear another sawtooth. Nothing particularly exciting going on there. It's playing three sawtooths, all at identical, pitch and phase. The third one is 80% as loud as the other two. The real magic with multi-voicing comes in when you detune those oscillators against each other. So now I'm going to introduce a tiny amount of oscillator detune. Press the same key. Wildly different result. Each of those oscillators is now playing against each other in a really interesting dynamic way. You're getting constantly shifting phase cancellation uh, of those three different waves playing against each other. And you can see it in the spectrum analyzer, these kind of ripples. It's a little bit like the comb filter, but it's dynamic. 
to the rippling of the waves as the each of those three oscillators they're all out of tune with each other they're all moving at different speeds very subtle detuned val values on your multi-voice oscillator are absolutely fabulous if you crank this detune value up a little bit more now you get something more into the science fiction sort of territory because they're wildly out of tune with each other and you get lots of dissonance which can be a great effect but a little bit less kind of normally musically useful and then we've got stereo spread let's bring that down a little bit to make it nice and i'll give us plenty of voices so that it's really thick and unctuous and now stereo spread at maximum those voices are being distributed across the stereo field as opposed to they're all mono now they're all smack in the middle there's no stereo spread yeah stereo is lovely and now that we've engaged the multi oscillator mode you can see more little white triangles more modulatable values let's turn that back off and jump up to our wave shapes again let's have a talk about some of these other options available you can see each of the four wave types has a sync cm and xor we'll deal with each of them in turn sync otherwise known as hard sync is the process whereby uh, you tie two oscillators together they're called a master and a slave in this sense what you're seeing the sine wave in the primary view has become the the, the slave oscillator and there's a hidden master oscillator in the background you can't see it it doesn't matter what shape it is. I think it's actually a sine wave, but it doesn't matter. All it's doing is deciding when the slave wave is going to get reset. The waveform knob determines how often the master oscillator is going to reset the slave oscillator. It's pretty easy to see this effect in the oscilloscope. I'll turn the waveform down to zero and you get a simple waveform. There's your sine wave, nothing spectacular going on. Now, if I increase the waveform knob to 10, what you've got there is the sine wave being drawn and then it gets about, I don't know, maybe 30% of the way through drawing its next cycle before something is coming along and interrupting its flow. This point here where you've got this vertical line, that's a reset command coming from this master oscillator. The slave oscillator resets and begins drawing its wave again, gets to the same point again, and is, is reset. What this means is that you've now got this new, very complex shape being defined by the pitch of the master oscillator. The only thing that the slave oscillator is responsible for is drawing as many waves as it can in this fixed time slice. And, and the result of all of this is that the pitch control of the slave which is now the waveform knob. This waveform knob is the pitch control of our slave oscillator, but it's now become a tonal effect. Turn it up a little bit. What you're hearing there is different interesting shapes being drawn inside this fixed period of time. That period of time never changes. That's the master oscillator in the background and that's tied to the key press and there's nothing we can do about it. All we have control of is how many mini waves we draw inside that space. So the pitch never changes because it's the master oscillator that determines the pitch. The slave oscillator determines the color or tone of the sound. So we can define different wave shape types for our slave oscillator. Here's a triangle being slaved to the master. And because these are such unusual shapes, only syncing can generate a wave shape that looks like that. So it has that unique sound to it. Once again, this is about subtractive synthesis, finding interesting ways to do cool things to our ears using very simple wave shapes we're still dealing with the same basic building blocks of sound we're just using different mathematical processes to make them as interesting as possible the next one along stands for cross modulation and in this case what's happened is once again we've introduced a new secret hidden oscillator 
but this time the secret hidden oscillator is going to be used to modulate the pitch, the frequency of our, this is now called a carrier wave. So the, the thing that you're looking at is still the primary wave shape. You can see it's been slightly deformed because now there's this second oscillator playing in the background. Now what the waveform knob's going to do is introduce this thing called cross modulation. So imagine you've got these two oscillators, the one that you can see and the hidden one, we'll call them A and B. Oscillator A is going to modulate the pitch of oscillator B and oscillator B is going to modulate the pitch of oscillator A. And you're going to result in something that sounds like frequency modulation. Well, it is frequency modulation. It's just cross modulation CM. That sound that you're hearing, any FM enthusiast, uh, frequency modulation enthusiast will recognize it. That's what frequency modulation sounds like. The pitch of our oscillator is being varied very quickly at audible rates, hundreds of times a second. And you end up with this kind of really shimmering, very unique sounding effect. It's very digital as you turn this waveform knob up. So this is the amount of cross modulation being applied. Once again, the waveform knob doing dynamic things depending on the wave shape, the wave type that you've selected. Our final wave type, the exclusive or wave type, again uses secret hidden oscillators, this time two square waves that are combined together using this mathematical process called an exclusive or. Don't particularly need to worry about the algorithm itself. But the result is a very brash kind of metallic impact on the on the carrier wave. In this case, we have a sine wave that's being modulated by these hidden square waves. Similar to what we did with the sync option, when we had phase reset, we get phase resets with the XOR, but this time they're of a more complex manner, which is gonna generate additional harmonics and make the sound more dissonant. So as I introduce the waveform, Basically, the pitches, the relative pitches of the square waves behind the scenes of, of what's being modulated, and that's resulting in wild uh, modulation of the of the output pitch. So as you can see now, these shapes are far more complex than we had with the sync oscillator, but a similar kind of thing where you can see uh, phase reset occurring. Just taking a snapshot of a particular wave here. Let's have a look at an example of a triangle. It's quite noisy, really harsh, metallic sounding. Come back to the same point. Subtractive synthesis is about having great palettes of sound to play with. And XOR is definitely one of the brasher, uh, harsher effects to play with. In addition to the three primary oscillators, we've got some extra oscillators. The sub oscillator first. This literally just generates a subtone. Uh, the pitch of the subtone, we need to jump over to another section briefly, is controlled from the pitch section. Uh, we have a value here called octave. This is going to be your primary determinant of the pitch of the sub oscillator. Let's not worry too much about that. It's just going to make some really simple, obviously low bass centered sounds. And by default, the level is set to zero. So when I press a key, you don't hear it. Let's bring it in. And there's our sub. So the C that I was playing previously, which was operating at 130 hertz, is now one octave lower than that. We have a few simple wave uh, types to choose from. Nothing as complex as the primary oscillators. Pretty straightforward, the sub. Next along, we have a ring modulator. Again, the level set to zero, but this time when I turn the level up, you're still not going to hear anything. I'll press a key. Because the ring modulator requires an input from two other oscillators. At the moment, oscillators one and two are supplying the ring modulator. And as you can see, you can choose um, different combinations of oscillators to, um, to feed into the ring modulator. The idea of a ring modulator is that you multiply two oscillators together and listen to the output. So the simplest way to demonstrate a ring modulator is to get up two sine waves. I'm going to set their phases identical at zero degrees. It doesn't particularly matter just to keep everything really clean. And I'm going to set oscillator two to three semitones above oscillator one. I'll play some notes a little bit higher up the keyboard. So oscillator one is cycling at 260 hertz. Oscillator two at 311 hertz. The ring modulator output 
is going to be the sum and difference of those two waves. So I'm going to turn the oscillators themselves off. We can't hear them anymore. All you're going to hear is the ring modulator. So the sum of those two waves is going to be 570 hertz, but you're also going to hear the difference between the two waves, which is going to be 50 hertz. Watching the spectrum analyzer, we have two sine waves, one at 570 hertz, one at 50 hertz. The important point to note is that the original waves are not there. The fundamentals at 260 and 311 hertz are missing. With a ring modulator, you only hear the sum and difference. And what that's going to result in is an enharmonic or dissonant sound because there's actually no harmonic relationship between 50 hertz and 570 hertz. They don't really have anything in common. You can hear quite clearly that there's a lot of dissonance between those two notes. Now, dissonance is one of the primary characteristics of metallic sounds because metals don't have fundamentals, they only have overtones. And so ring modulators are often used to generate metallic sounds. Sine waves are a great demonstration tool because you can see the purity of the original waves. But when we bring in something a little bit more complex, like a sawtooth being multiplied with a sine wave, Ring modulators are known for making particularly brutal and violent enharmonic sounds. Finally, we have the noise module, which generates noise. By default, it's going to be white noise, which is all the harmonics all the time. Increase the level. That's what noise sounds like. Then we have pink noise, which has a low pass filter applied to the noise. So basically some of the higher frequencies are going to be sculpted away and you can see that slope. So it's not that the base frequencies have been boosted, the upper frequencies have been attenuated. And then we have a couple of bandpass options. So white noise with a bump in the middle, or more accurately, the lower and upper frequencies being attenuated, and then a combination of all that stuff. Low pass filter plus a bandpass in the middle. Noise is another one of those great tools for subtractive synthesists because it's got all of the frequencies and that means there are tons of really interesting things that you can do with them and we'll cover some of those possibilities in this tutorial series. Woo, that was a long one. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.